By the philosophy of dynamic Filipinism, 
The university is committed to develop individuals who are able to realize their self-worth and create a productive role as responsible citizens in an ever-changing world. The university believes in nurturing independent, self-motivated, and self-reliant individuals who assume greater responsibility for their own learning, take on active and meaningful leadership roles, and become increasingly aware of and sensitive to their independent roles in our community. The College of Education, Arts, and Sciences, or CIS, is committed in honing future professionals and citizens that will contribute to their chosen communities, to effect change in their respective industries, and to be part of nation building. CIS is centered around two E's excellent service and ethical standards. Excellent service through conducive environment for learning and more especially through strong faculty roster who are equipped with the established and emerging paradigms and practices in the field of education, arts and sciences together with strong linkages in different industries. Ethical standards not only in reaffirming the core values of the university, but also in emphasizing social responsibility as its guiding principle. We offer programs that will enable students to become the person they wish to be. Our undergraduate programs include Bachelor of Arts in Communication, Bachelor of Arts in English Language Studies, Bachelor of Science in Psychology, Bachelor of Secondary Education, major in English. Bachelor of Elementary Education. Bachelor of Physical Education. Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. For our graduate programs, the college offers Master of Arts in Education, major in Educational Management, English, Filipino, Special Education, Doctor of Education, Major in Education Management. Bachelor of Arts in Communication is a degree program that offers students the core theories and practices of communication in effecting change and development in the society, be it in the public or the private spheres. The program focuses on the effective planning, design, and implementation of key programs and projects in communication and media complemented with strong research foundation. The Bachelor of Arts in English Language Studies program is designed to strengthen the students' competencies in English language and enrich their knowledge of the discipline. It also aims to provide opportunities for the practical application of language proficiencies acquired in the workplace. Many ABELS graduates of National University pursued careers in the academe, the tourism industry, research, in publishing or editing, as media practitioner or correspondent, among others. The Bachelor of Science in Psychology is a program structured to equip learners with the needed skills in providing psychosocial services to individuals and organizations. Graduates are expected to develop professional and reflective attitude in the practice of psychology, including qualities of leadership, responsibility, personal integrity, empathy, and respect to others. Many graduates of BS Psychology had pursued careers as psychometrician, human resources personnel, clinical psychologists, counselors, social workers, among others. The Bachelor of Secondary Education major in English is a four-year undergraduate teacher education program designed to equip learners with adequate and relevant needed aptitude to teach English language and literature subjects at the secondary level. After successful completion of all academic requirement, BSED English primarily went on to pursue successful careers in teaching. Other career options await the graduates, which includes 
graduate studies in reputable local and foreign universities, English as a second or foreign language teacher, ESL, EFL, technical writer, literary specialist, civil or government service, and development work. The Bachelor of Physical Education is a program aimed at equipping graduates with the aptitude to meet the psychomotor, cognitive, and affective needs of learners. These consist of strong and substantial foundation of the subject matter that informs their curricular choices when planning, designing, and implementing and assessing learning activities. An understanding of the scope and sequence of various movement forms as well as elements. The Bachelor of Elementary Education provides students with relevant, innovative, and accessible quality education to produce effective and efficient teachers in school. The program aims to instill core values needed to become successful educators with emphasis on leadership, critical thinking, and creativity. The newest addition to SEAS is the Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. It is a degree program which aims to further develop the critical and logical thinking skills grounded on theories of power, institutions, identity, and how these operate in the real world. The knowledge and skills therein translate as examples skills applicable in different fields and offers wider opportunities in academe, public service, international relations, corporate industry, and more. This program will be offered starting academic year 2022 to 2023. We can't wait to meet you and become part of the National U community. As we say here, we raise the flag of gold and blue. See you! Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Dear Father, we thank you for everyone gathered here now. Thank you that you know each of us by name and have caused us to walk with you. We say that we are dependent on you and our trust is in you completely. As we surrender ourselves in adoration, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you may open our ears so we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. Lord, we thank you for the speakers and facilitators. We pray that you would give them great inspiration as they share with us what you have placed in their hearts 
We pray that you would fill them with courage and give them your peace. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiliw, kaya sa sigahanan, alam ng puso sa nitip ko'y buhay. Upang nililang, kaya ka nang magiting, sa mandulupin, di ka pasisigil, sa nagatap. It's a sunny morning here in Quezon and I hope everyone is safe and well amidst the pandemic. Welcome back to another Wednesday here at our National Heritage Alumni Webinar Hour entitled Papa Loy's Respectable Love of Country and Independence. Good day, Nationalians here and around the world. I am Leroy Rubio and we will be hearing another informative and interesting discussion that is very important to the NU community and to the entire nation. We will be hearing about the story of the man who had his humble beginnings from Bohol and uh, as a law student in the Philippine Law School of National University who went on to become the 8th President of the Philippines. We are live in the Nationalian Heritage Facebook page, cross-potted with uh, NHCP Museo ng Pamana at Kasaysayang Boholano, Nationalian Heritage, NU Mathematics Society, SEAS, SEAS Student Council, NU Society of Elementary Education, NU Psychology Society, National University Manila Organization of Physical Education Majors, the Communication, the Compendium, the NU SEAS Social Sciences, the NU SEAS Humanities Facebook pages respectively via Microsoft Teams. Let me first give everyone a brief overview of this webinar. We all know that President Carlos P. Garcia was a native of Talibon, Bohol, and when he was about to pursue his law studies, he entered the then Philippine Law School, which was under National University. He finished his law studies in 1923 and eventually went on to have a prolific political career and route to becoming the nation's chief executive in 1957, after the tragic death of President Ramon Magsaysay. And oh, by the way, kindly send your shoutouts and greetings in our FB pages and in MS Teams for Nationalian employees, students, and guests who are tuned in. And also to type your questions to our guest speakers if there is any. Now, without further ado, let me now introduce our first guest speaker. He's the professor and dean of the School of Law, City University of Pasay, and concurrently serves as professor and dean of the College of Business Administration, City University of Pasay. He's also a professorial lecturer at the University of, Fi of the Philippines de Leman, Ateneo de Manila University, De La Salle University Manila, New Era University, De La Salle College of St. Benilde, and Adventist University of the Philippines College of Medicine. Equally, he is the City Legal Officer too of the City Government of Pasay. He obtained his graduate degrees in History, Politics, and Law from the University of the Philippines de Leman and San Beda University Graduate School of Law. He specializes in Diplomatic History, Economic History, Legal History, intercult Intercultural History, Public Policy, Fiscal Administration, and Labor Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big virtual round of applause to Attorney Severo Cañete Madrona, Jr., Ph.D. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Roy? Yes, you're well audible, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for the invitation. Likewise to Dr. Ryan Villegas for inviting me to be part of your uh, uh, webinar on the famous or recognized uh, Nationalian uh, alumni that you have actually. And definitely uh, it's been a big opportunity on my part to likewise again share my study with respect to Carlos P. Garcia. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, so um, this is actually my uh, my lecture actually concerns much with uh, Carlos P. Garcia. Uh, first, I want to I mean, Carlos P. Garcia and intellectual history. So uh, this is actually one of my like specialization, looking at the intellectual history of Carlos P. Garcia, looking at his ideas, and I think um, I am very much. Uh, well, again, I am glad that Dr. Villegas uh, informed me that I have to discuss likewise um, how am I going to look at the in new core values with Carlos B. Garcia. And again, that's much uh, welcome with respect to intellectual history. Um, I get interested with Carlos B. Garcia uh, generally with the concept of diplomatic history as a foreign policy um, uh, specialist myself. I'm dealing much with the Cold War foreign policy. So when I did my graduate work in history, um, I have to look on what will be the field that I have to focus on. And again, uh, I was looking on the various precedents, and I found out that no one had done or studied actually Carlos P. Garcia. It's again so sad because, again, as mentioned, he was very prolific, and again, he was also, again, uh, the eighth president of the Philippines, but no one had done a study on him. He was actually, um, well, um, overwhelmed by his predecessor, um, Ramon Magsaysay, a uh, very famous president, actually. And then later on, of course, uh, with Mar Mr. Marcos after Mahapagal. So the two presidents, actually, Garcia and Mahapagal, they were somewhat in the blind, or somewhat, again, no one had done um, study on him. With his dad, Mahapagal, uh, he wrote a lot about his extent as the president, but Carlos P. Garcia did not. So we have then to look upon him and study, or like, try again to uh, understand what was his ideas or what ideas but again as i mentioned i focus uh, in my graduate studies with him with his foreign policy advocacies his actually uh, um, uh, the philippine foreign relations during his time but later on as i move on again because again a lot of opportunities came in i want to focus now on the intellectual history of garcia the milieu or the period he was in the context of him and again his ideas the fact that nothing or basically only few materials have been published uh, with respect to garcia we also realized then that I think there's a need to study him more and study him better. And I think it's a good opportunity for uh, NU then uh, to look at it in the core values. So again, that's a really interesting one to how we're going to tie this up with the life of this person, Carlos P. Garcia. As I always said, uh, it was my father who introduced me to Carlos P. Garcia, basically as a historical figure or as an, a subject in history, actually, because my father regaled me with stories about how during the Garcia's presidency, uh, it was again a difficult, I mean, an interesting time. And likewise, how um, uh, a, a Bohol, a, a person from Bohol, from the Visayas, able then to become the president of the Philippines, that's normally again dominated mainly by those from Luzon. And again, it's also been uh, widely discussed then that the Visayas and the Mindanao, they may not be able to produce a president, well, except for Sergio Osmeña earlier, but again, Garcia then, no one expected him to be such. So uh, my lecture actually would focus much with two uh, major concepts. The first one, I want to look at again, Carlos P. Garcia's historical figure, and then I'm going to tie this up with what has been requested to do, uh, the Garcia and the ANU core value. So as uh, being part of an intellectual history, my concern here is about the ideas how uh, the history of ideas or how actually Garcia as an intellectual able to do it or how he would be able then to in his life how can we read him how are we going to understand him better 
So aside from just reading the news or reading actually the newspapers, because again, that was the major source of materials here in Carlos P. Garcia. So I think um, at first, I don't want to focus much on the domestic policies because again, of the lack of sources. And again, as a historian, we always look at the sources. If you have no sources, you cannot write something about it. But uh, with Garcia, the domestic policies focus much with newspaper accounts. And you have to read between the lines. Uh, in foreign policy, we have a lot actually uh, of materials that can't supposedly look at it. But again, we want to see then at first historical failure. Then the second part I mentioned would be Garcia and the new core values that uh, has been given to me, the concept of compassionate, uh, compassionate uh, integrity, patriotism, respect, innovation, and, and all others then that we'll be discussing later on. So let's start first with Carlos Politis, Politico Garcia um, as a historical figure. And again, we need to understand him because, well, in the picture actually that I've taken likewise, uh, well, uh, he's basically a recognized chess player. So, um, I, know, I mean, unlike with um, another or other politicians that might be very vocal actually with what he would like to say, uh, he's been considered a man of few words. And definitely it's because either he is already thinking in his mind what he's going to do, or basically as a chess player then, he's already thinking of what's the next move. So some, of course, would not be um, so kind in looking at that because, again, they might think that that would be contrary to as a politician. Why are you not supposedly saying everything that you want? I mean, uh, why it's only been a few words? And definitely for that then, it would be a spokesperson who will be the one to mention a lot of what Garcia wanted. And of course, we can look at that differently when not a thing like that. So definitely as a chess player, that could give you a lot of inputs already on Carlos V. Garcia. The first thing you have to understand, again, it was uh, historically he was an unexpected president. No one expected him to become the president of the Philippines because, again, the fact that he came from Bohol. Secondly, uh, again, uh, we're not saying that people from Bohol would not begin. So, part is, again, as I mentioned, national politics dominated mainly by Luzon and dominated mainly by, let's say, in the capital and urban centers, um, maybe Manila and Cebu, as well as in the other areas. But the idea there is that um, he was, again, unexpected because um, aside from uh, his came from the province, uh, the second one also is that he was like quite an old uh, politician at the time when he was elected as vice president of then Ramon Magsaysay. Uh, Magsaysay actually, uh, basically, he was chosen as the running mate of Ramon Magsaysay because no one wanted to be uh, the vice president of Ramon Magsaysay, a very charismatic figure, a very actually... Um, active president, so to speak, I mean, even before becoming president as secretary of national defense, again, he was very active. And everyone knows, again, of his uh, popularity with that of the Americans. So the idea there is that who would be want to be the vice president of Magsaysay? I mean, uh, everyone expects him to serve more than one term, and everyone to, uh, expects him actually to serve more than that. So in that, in that context, then, even the famous at the time, Arsenio H. Laxon, then the mayor of Manila, who was actually also a very active uh, figure in, uh, in uh, post-war Philippines, would not want to be the vice president of Ramon Magsaysay. So it was then Carlos P. Garcia who was then um, came up with Magsaysay because, again, Magsaysay being young and Garcia being old and Garcia being, again, an old nationalist and Magsaysay just transferred from liberal party But then against that, he of men, the standing um, figure of his political party. And for that then, he became then the vice president of Magsaysay. And true enough then, Magsaysay let him be as it is, as a secretary of foreign affairs. And while Mag Garcia then was doing well, we need to discuss about this in, the, in part of his foreign policy, but again, the idea is that um, he remained as not that, again, uh, popular compared to his president, Ramon Magsaysay. So, uh, if you're going to look on that period, then uh, Garcia would be serving as Foreign Affairs Secretary and he would be out of the country dealing much with uh, negotiations, being part of the United Nations, with the Shato, and everything then that will be dealing with that. And definitely, not in the media, not everyone expects him to be successor Magsaysay later on. Because again, everyone expects him to just retire after possibly even one term or of Magsaysay and then let it be. Well, again, the fact that he became the vice president, then that's to be it. But everyone 
was surprised, of course, when Magsaysay died in March 17 of 1957. And here comes everyone's surprise saying that we have a new president, an unexpected one. And everyone was looking, who is Carlos F. Garcia? Aside from the fact that he was the vice president, what was his record? He used to be, again, a senator of the republic, again, uh, before the war, and even after the war, before he was, again, uh, teamed up with Ramon Magsaysay, he was then actually considered as, again, uh, a politician who served from the lower end. Because, again, he served as a governor of the province of Bohol, and also, again, served like was a representative of the province of Bohol uh, in the assembly. So, again, he was then... Uh, quote-unquote, a politician, an undefeated politician since time that he started in Bohol up to he became a national figure. And then again, still no one knows him that much. So he was actually an enigma now for everyone looking at Jose Garcia. So when my father told me, I was really surprised then that this come the president actually that no one knows that much. When I read Agoncillo, I read Constantino, not that much mentioned about Garcia. So, actually, it's a, he's a really important, I mean, it's a really interesting figure then in history that we need to look on. And, and on to Maney, likewise, uh, although it's only well part of his biography, uh, Garcia actually is a literary genius. So again, quite really interesting, as I mentioned a while ago, that he's a man of a few words, but he's actually uh, recognized more in literary. Um, he was able then to write a lot of uh, Cebuano or Boholano, Cebuano poems, actually. Uh, like the famous Dalagal, Dalagang Pilipinhon. And basically, he was recognized as such in his film. And he used this more when he became a public school teacher. So Garcia actually was a public school teacher before becoming a politician or before becoming a lawyer or before studying law, actually. So he's actually a, a teacher, a public school teacher actually in Bohol. And in that context, then, he was able then to focus much with the folk um, literature in Bohol. And again, with the way that he actually wrote his poem, or wrote actually, uh, we call it Balak in uh, Cebuano, Boholano languages. Again, the Balak itself. And we'll really show you that he's a literary genius and a prolific one. Um, that could make you understand him better. But to, to view the man himself, we have to look on also how he's being actually um, recognized or how, what's the characteristic is being observed by the other persons contemporary with him. So, uh, according to Senator Rosseler Lim, um, a senator actually from Zamboanga, um, really a recognized, likewise, national figure, and um, a place now is named after him, uh, Garcia actually has the patience to look into details. So, that's a very interesting trait of a politician uh, to weigh a problem. So, he's not that, unlike with Magsay Sav, very energetic and would act immediately given a case or given, let's say, a situation that he would be there immediately, Garcia actually is just as a chess player. He's actually weighing all of his options. And we'll see later on how we have a repercussion to that. Uh, to search for alternatives, if necessary, and to bring to bear on this process of thinking and decision a literate thinking man. So again, he's a very important uh, figure in intellectual history. Again, you have to look him as an intellectual. And in that sense, as mentioned by Senator Rosalind Lim, uh, he represents a contrast to the late Magsaysay, who could know someone as a patient patient. Definitely, Magsaysay is not a patient man. Uh, we can observe in a lot of materials being already declassified. We can see him as a different one and a very active. So, I guess I mentioned no one wants to become the vice president of him because he's around. But Garcia is not a person. Uh, let alone sustain in the function of a problem patient. He was is weighing it, and he can wait for what would be the better options, better alternatives then. So, uh, for some then, that could be something like, the I mean, for a politician, that people would need something. And I think this could be misconstrued later on by some people as something like, he's waiting for, or he's not that active. And definitely, that could be one of the reasons, likewise, why he would be defeated later on by successor, uh, just Dado Mahapagal. And also... Uh, following with the footsteps of Ramon Magsaysa is very active and very energetic. Maybe it's because of the age, likewise, or something on that effect. And according to, um, um, of course, uh, Nick Joaquin, uh, everyone knows about him as a literary, um, 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 I mean, as a writer, actually, Nick Joaquin, the writer. Um, he mentioned that if uh, Garcia speaks in a dozen times in one day, the 12th speech he will deliver with the same coldness and deliberation as if the first one, uh, as the first one, as if 
he were just starting the day's grind. So uh, you might look at it differently then that Garcia actually was um, having a monotonous voice. It's not really that uh, that concern us. But again, the idea is that uh, he would be at the same. So you cannot feel, according to Nick Joaquin, the tiredness, whatever. So that, again, that's a feel of a person that uh, that really used to speak or uh, used to uh, give his his mind, but again, in a very limited manner. Or it's not again that vociferous or uh, always been uh, there and all. But so he weigh everything then, and again, uh, you cannot feel in that uh, he's just. I mean, uh, he's just uh, making it a play. But again, he's doing it because he wanted the people to be to know what his real his mind. Um, Ambassador Carlos Piromolo, at the time, Ambassador of the Philippines to the United States, and the former Secretary of Foreign Affairs, at least, uh, before uh, Garcia became one in time of Sadu Mahap, I mean, Ramon Magsaysay, um, uh, Romolo actually was already there as Secretary of Foreign Affairs of President Elpidio Quirino. So, uh, they're both actually uh, foreign affairs experts, so to speak, I mean, uh, from Romolo going towards, uh, in the case of uh, Garcia. And uh, Romolo actually, um, had this in his um, uh, uh, memoirs for because again he works I mean he worked with a lot of Philippine presidents from uh, from Quezon actually then moving towards then up to Marcos. He mentioned that um, Garcia was so methodical and basically he said that President Garcia's calls for instance when calling from Manila to Washington where Romulo was the Philippine ambassador of the United States. Uh, the president's calls were carefully prepared in advance. And seldom lasted over 30 minutes. Again, it's quite interesting because um, as a politician, you may be wondering that he should be able to tell a lot. But basically, as I mentioned, he's methodical. It's a man of few words. So he would go over the items in the list by point. Now, Mr. Ambassador number one, number two. When do we the list? I went through the list. He would go back to the beginning. Now, number one, what is your opinion? And run down the list again. All questions asked. All answers valid. He would give his own reactions to my answers. I agree with you on that. I don't agree with you on number two, etc. When our telephone conversation ended, all business had been completed. So again, that's that's a very interesting observation of the man saying then that he made his business. He wanted to accomplish it as soon as possible without any nitty gritty, without any hunky planky. We have to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Yeah. As a speaker, Garcia tended to be again, because again, he's a literary genius, he's a poet. He's actually concerned much with literal Shakespearean characteristic, probably about that. Somewhat long winded, but he had complete mastery of the facts. Well, as a training as a lawyer, as an as a as a poet actually in his native dialect or language, he could not persist an occasional circumlocation of flowery phrase in English, again, uh, something like part of his context or tradition, but on the basis of his statement does always sound. So again, um, the observation of Romulo makes you have now in mind uh, how is Carlos P. Garcia as a person then? So, uh, a methodical, um, uh, actually, uh, he's following, um, he wants to accomplish this much. And basically, he uh, he had his, his, he had his less, actually. And if you're going to read Romulo, actually, he was also uh, uh, mentioning it as different from that of President Ramon Magsaysay, where Magsaysay actually was so, as we called it again, uh, you can't accomplish that much. Because again, he kept on telling stories about his and his exploits and forgetting then what was the purpose of the call? What was the purpose of the meeting that you have then with him? So I think that's a different outlook again on the person uh, named uh, Carlos B. Garcia. Uh, Garcia was revealed, of course, to be loyal to Manuel Alcazar because uh, during the colonial period, we'll discuss this part of the Inyo core values. And uh, close, of course, to Jose P. Laurel um, in the period after independence. So... Uh, so we will discuss this part of his nationalist posturing and probably you can look at his in your core values of uh, integrity and patriotism. And Garcia, as was a passive leader, who left actually key policymakers elaborate. As I mentioned again, um, the problem, that's why I, mean, that's why I know his, I mean, some historians would not want to dwell on Garcia because of the lack of materials. Uh, because you need to read them, uh, those, uh, I mean, the... the the materials written by his uh, contemporaries or written by his key policymakers, like one also of the uh, alumnus of uh, Philippine Law School, ANU, uh, as I think I've seen this part of your, um, uh, I mean, part of your materials, Felix Berto Serrano. Sir, uh, Felix Berto Serrano, actually, um, who I think graduated from class of 1936 from the Philippine Law School, uh, time part of the ANU, 
Um, he was the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Carlos P. Garcia. And definitely, if you're going to look at foreign policy of Garcia, then you will have to read Felix Verto Serrano. Because again, as described herein, he let his key policymakers elaborate on their proposals. But he avoided direct intervention, especially in controversial issues. So something also very interesting to Garcia is that he avoided as much to uh, confront the issues readily. So he's trying to simmer it down, then confront it later on. So instead of uh, uh, deliberately look at it as, as, as soon as possible, as I mentioned, he weigh all his options. What can be done with that and probably can be resolved in a different way. As mentioned again by Felix Berto Serrano, uh, also um, a graduate of Philippine Law School in U, in class 1936, he said that Garcia faced with courage what was in the past was a matter of mere nebulous awareness or indifferent acquiescence, or even a fear to uh, recognize and grapple it with reasons or motives of dubious force and validity. So I think this would be something like a very uh, a good affirmation of um, Felix Berto Serrano on the person of Carlos V. Garcia. Well, again, Serrano was also a very interesting figure. Um, he would have his intramurals with the likes, again, of Carlos Viromolo as well as Salvador Pilopez. But again, it's a different story, but just showing to you then that um, Garcia did not choose Romulo to be their foreign affairs or the popular Salvador Pilopez. Again, he choose, likewise, Serrano, who's also a difficult or interesting figure as a politician himself. So, uh, however, uh, if you look on the other side, the American diplomats, for instance, as being uh, discussed by the source already, said that uh, he's a pro-American. Well, uh, at the time, uh, definitely all top Philippine leaders, uh, except for Claro Imrecto and uh, Jose Pelaurel, probably, uh, you can look at them as something like having anti-American sentiments. But uh, as described likewise here, uh, he's pro-American, but not a man, again, as I mentioned, uh, he would be uh, misinterpreted because of his uh, actions. He is, again, I mean, if you're going to compare him with Ramon Magsaysay, he's very active and energetic. If you have an old man trying to then to uh, weigh down his decisions at the time, then some would say he's not a man of strong principles and willing to compromise for political benefit. Again, that's we can look at it differently because, again, the idea is that Mag uh, Garcia was already a seasoned politician when he became the president then. So he was able to serve from the governor position, member of the Philippine Assembly, then moving towards senator. So he was there. I mean, he was been serving for a long time. So definitely, uh, it can be considered as a compromise then, or for political benefit. And well, uh, I would disagree to the concept of easily influencing an if, but either is that like uh, Garcia believed on his people. And once uh, the people, when the DBS have been appointed by him, then he let him uh, again, govern that department or agency of which that person was there. Uh, again, the U.S., the Americans, interestingly, would have a different um, look upon him. Uh, it was described as a shrewd old guard nationalist. Again, being really, as I mentioned, he's been there with the party for a long time. Uh, also, opportunistic approach, uh, opportunistic approach to the problems of government and tendency to surround himself with weak men uh, dependent upon him politically, which again, not true because if you look upon this uh, persons appointed would have their own uh, personalities. And even uh, for a time, he appointed a lot of his uh, compatriots from Bohol because again, maybe it's a, it's a problem likewise because he came from the province. Um, the thing is that um, you are not the Manileño type or you're not the Metro Manila type or the Luzon base that you have a wide network. So uh, for a time, actually, uh, what he did he appointed all of his uh, uh, compatriots from Bohol in various top positions. Which, again, some would say then would lead to a concept of regionalism uh, that maybe actually would have an effect with how you viewed him later on. So, in fact, in the short period of administration, according to the Americans, have in fact resulted in serious decline in effective leadership and sharp rise in government corruption. Uh, Judge and research president, um, most of Garcia's energy and attention are apparently focused on considering his political power by patronage, political payoffs, and playing off one faction against another. So I think this uh, the description made by the Americans would always be um, uh, applicable to all national politicians at the time. But it sounds like that uh, Garcia, of course, was there. And the Americans uh, could not uh, I mean, always have to differentiate him with Ramon Magsaysay. So I think that is the main difference then. Garcia has no wide political base. Uh, well, 
probably again coming from the province and is only relying too much with nationalista party but uh, as an old guard nationalista party he had the support of the party and definitely he won in 1987 because of the plurality of votes uh, if you have more candidates running in then the incumbent will win again that can be a poll Political uh, principle or uh, com uh, political uh, campaign strategy again that if you have more opponents, then the incumbent will win. He was incumbent at the time, so he was able then to win over the favorites by the Americans or those supported by the sugar barons, let's say, of, of Negros and all others. So, this uh, he was able to do it. So, but again, this is again an unacceptable uh, interpretation of Garcia by the Americans. Um, I view that it this way, that the character of Garcia gives one an image of a solemn, quite uh, uh, reserved man uh, who was full of nationalist ideals. And again, that could also be, as, as, as mentioned, one of your core pillars or core, core values, sorry, of National University, and probably of the being a nationalist. And no one can deny he's a nationalist. Uh, we'll discuss it later on. Um, he's a conciliatory leader who is in high need for affiliation. Uh, well, probably as I observed it, because uh, you're trying to gain support. You're coming from the province, and you're becoming again the president. Then, and you need support from those from the urban uh, centers, the urban elites, as I call it. Then, uh, basically, uh, while he is recognized probably by his party, but still, some party mates of him would believe that they are better than him, because again. Uh, the concept again is that we are from the urban centers, you're not from the urban centers. Again, that's kind of the idea then about the, uh, trying to um, uh, belittle his accomplishments, achievements. Uh, trusting others to exhibit little belief in their own ability to control the events in which they are involved. So uh, that's again uh, my concept here or my... Uh, of my uh, look at Garcia himself. Uh, sadly, uh, Garcia, of course, we cannot deny that uh, we have, if you read actually uh, Gonzalo and Constantino uh, about Carlos V. Garcia, there's always allegation of him being a corrupt. So we have, again, a allegation of being a corrupt president. Um, he was mainly criticized for purchasing the Lapu Lapu. Uh, it's a luxurious yacht, a 5 million yacht, and the spirit of Mactan, a presidential plane during his time. I think um, you always heard about this in the later years about presidents purchasing something like a presidential plane or presidential yacht and you always again look back at Garcia how he did it despite again contrary to his particular issue with austerity as again as part of the core values we're going to discuss later on and like was criticized for his handling of scandals involving operations of uh, government-owned corporations such as the People's Home Site and Housing Corporation and Government Service Insurance System or GSIS um, he was actually in fight with his also, an old guard nationalista, uh, Yulihio Amang Rodriguez, um, at the time Senate President, um, who actually uh, uh, issued the white paper uh, alleging, actually, uh, or exposing the supposed uh, corruption scandals of Garcia, his province, mate, province mates from the Bohol, actually, and his uh, wife's family. So, I think um, the issue of nepotism, not nepotism, but the issue actually of uh, focusing too much with his province mates. Uh, would hunt Garcia actually during his time. I think uh, it's also the issue again of whom you can trust at the time in national politics. But an interview, uh, Garcia has said uh, as misgiving. I think uh, it's let me admit Garcia because he could not uh, that much able to express what's in his mind. So he was again misinterpreted by a lot of people. So um, Garcia's misgivings on the way the local newspaper, the Philippines Free Press, and even the Time Magazine, the Time, the Time Magazine. Um, uh, have been handling the graph and corruption case stories and shows his uh, displeasure over the fact that the president was always blamed for every anonymous cause in the government. Again, following with uh, the Caudillo type system of government in the Philippines, where again, the man on top or the leader should always be blamed for all the problems in the government. The nation's concern with graph and corruption in the government, Garcia's cabinet launched an all out campaign against graph and corruption. But um, it was again um, you being used later on by just Dado Mahapagal, but we're all aware about the Stonehill uh, controversy in Mahapagal. So something like uh, Mahapagal um, later on can also claim otherwise that there was no graft and corruption in his time because the Stonehill uh, issue will also come out. So uh, that would be again uh, a view on Garcia in intellectual history tradition then. So we'll just focus ourselves with uh, 
how it's been applied in his life, the new core values. As again, that is part of, um, has been mentioned to me that I should also focus on how Garcia then exemplified the core values of ANU. And again, as a graduate of the Philippine Law School in part of National University, it's better to look on the core values that's being applied to his life for that. Uh, the first I have to look at the core values would be concept of integrity and patriotism. So uh, in your uh, website in NU, you have there actually the core values and as part of your integrity is how you are or um, this is what you are. And you have to stand on it as being rightful as you are. And also part with patriotism, uh, you also mentioned again, love of your country. And I think uh, there's no one that can look better than that with Garcia with his national, nationalist posture. Um, we can look at it, that Garcia actually, in his posture, uh, well, um, it's quite uh, very, uh, not really uh, that good match with comparison what's happening now in the war in Ukraine versus Russia. Um, you have actually Ukrainians being uh, so patriotic that they didn't want to lead their country and even their president again. But Garcia actually at the time of the war, Second World War, when the Japanese were here, um, he was then the governor of Bohol. And he had at least uh, two possible options. Either he can leave the country, well, again, this was also being offered to the president of Ukraine now with the United States, but he can leave the country, join possibly Manuel Quezon. The other option of him, of course, is to collaborate with the Japanese. It's a better one rather than fight it off, why not collaborate with the Japanese? I mean, uh, be a puppet governor of the province of Bohol. But he chose, he chose a third option. leaving Bohol and then having to be exiled himself, he prefers to be a guerrilla leader and he went actually uh, in the mountains of Bohol, uh, governing then the wide array of the guerrilla uh, work or the guerrilla actually um, uh, activities against the Japanese in the province of Bohol. And for that, after the war, he would be recognized as a war hero, not with the fake war medals, but only as a real hero actually after the war. And no one can deny that no one actually would claim that he's not a war hero. Unlike with others who have been in a tag for fake war medals. But in Garcia, the war medals are real because again, the people of Bohol can attest then of his heroism as their governor who never left them despite the fact of possible offers of leaving or collaborating and enriching himself possibly during the occupation. So the idea is that that could be, as I think, look as a patriotism, as a core value. And likewise, again, as is being nationalist then. And even after the war, the Second World War, when he assumed back a senator of the Republic, he was also one of the first, or one of the few senators who opposed the parity rights amendments. Uh, for those, again, who are not aware of, after the war, the Americans made it a condition that before we'll give you more rehabilitation fund because of what happened to the war, you have to grant party rights to the Americans. So the idea there is that the Americans would have equal rights with Filipinos in the uh, natural resuscitation as well as with operation of public utilities. And Garcia again was not in favor of that. He was arguing that why would the Americans be given such recognition? I mean, why with the need? I mean. Uh, we've been loyal with you during the war, and here it comes now. Why are you interfering with our sovereignty? Interfering with our independence that you will be here, focusing much with our economic or our economy itself could be likewise be intervened by the Americans. I think. And he was again an anti party senator, and the one of the few. And he stand, basically, he, as a guerrilla leader, then, as a war hero, he said then that. Basically, we fought of actually for independence, not with the American again, but because we believe in the Republic itself. In that context, he allied with the nationalist group of more popular leaders, like, of course, Senator Claro M. Recto, and the former president of the Second Republic, Jose P. Laurel. Again, uh, Recto and Laurel tag as after the nationalist uh, duo or the nationalist bloc. And he would be recognized, quote unquote, with that ideals. So that could give you an insight then why the Americans were not that happy with him. Because again, starting with the parity rights and starting again later on with a question on American um, um, interference in foreign policy and like within Asia, you might give an insight already that Garcia is not an American man, contrary to that with Ramon Magsaysay. And the fact again, allying with this uh, national stalwarts of Recto and Laurel would give you a different insight again of the man.
Now, the other core values that I look upon would be the issue of compassion and industry. So, compassion, as uh, again, uh, being taking care actually of how people uh, would be uh, supposedly uh, uh, what have they suffered and definitely how are they going to look at it. So, um, during their CS time, it was the period actually where there also other uh, popular policy, not really popular, but infamous policy to speak, would be the politics of austerity. So, it was not Garcia's fault that we were that we were there. It was actually the fault of his predecessor, Ramon Magsaysay. But again, not too much had looked upon this. Uh, during the time of Magsaysay, again, uh, looking at the economic history itself, uh, Magsaysay actually had proposed or declared launch policy program like Import Reduction or ISI, which again, uh, if you look at economic uh, programs in after Second World War in Latin America, uh, the idea again is that you have to substitute supposedly what you have imported here. So it would be a part with supposedly a rapid industrialization program undertaken by his side. So and likewise deficit financing. So instead of uh, spending what you have collected from your taxes, what happened was that uh, Magsaysay keep on spending even if you have only the deficit economy. And of course, People were happy because again, they have seen a lot of projects, a lot of this. But the thing is considered that if this continue, what will happen to the economy then? So like, like you're just going to make your successor a beggar. And it happens with Garcia. So people may not consider it that Magsaysay's um, arrogance or Magsaysay's uh, misguided economic policy would have an effect actually with his successor. And... Garcia then would launch what you call austerity policy during his time. So reality, according to him, constrains us to restore the correct proportion between dollar reserves and industrialization. Paul Magsaysay was, uh, again, arguing that we need to do this. But the problem, again, is that, no, he failed to consider it may have an effect in the long-term economic program. And Garcia had to contain with that, and becoming very unpopular with the launch of austerity policy. So... Uh, again, it's a problem with presidents who are very much say, very concerned with economic programs and did not consider that look, what's the long, what's the national, what's the long-term effect of this? Uh, maybe during your presidency, you're able to supposedly show to the people a lot of your projects. But the thing is that what would happen afterwards? Where did you get the money for these projects? Is it about deficit uh, economic policies then? So according to Garcia. Between these reserves and bond policies, uh, bond, bond issues, and other forms of public borrowings. To achieve this end, it behoves us to submit temporarily to measures of austerity, self discipline, and self denial. In order again to help our fellow uh, human, fellow Filipinos, who are suffering because of the economic misguided policies of President Ramon Magsaysay during his time. So, Garcia then has to suffer with this politics of austerity. So, Central banks sought to curtail aggressive loans to businesses in general by increasing the rediscount rate and constraining immoderate imports through our policy on the letters of credit for the import trade and conservative uh, fiscal policy and gradual decontrol of foreign exchange control. Uh, as mentioned, I'm also specializing with public fiscal administration and I've seen actually uh, with respect to this on uh, the problems with um, deficit, gap, deficit uh, economy or more borrowings or something of that effect that um, you can consider them that why not spend what you can earn or borrowing is not bad per se if you know where it goes to. But if it's a concern then that um, the borrowings that happen mainly is to give it to your possible cronies or possible um, uh, preferred um, uh, businesses, then that would be a backlash now in the next administration. So that's something that we have to consider later on. Garcia also was uh, popular with his concept of Filipino first policy, although as already being mentioned, as uh, historians like Yusuke Takagi, a Japanese scholar, argued that it was not him. Uh, it was not Garcia alone for in policy. Uh, Garcia's domestic policy, but um, he's been recognized for such. During his time, it was launched, but uh, some would say it was not him or basically even opposed it. But just the same, uh, Garcia... Uh, somewhat uh, implemented this program of encourage Filipinos to engage in enterprises and industries vital to the economic growth, stability, and security of the country. In the 59 Central Bank uh, approved resolution number two while reducing foreign exchange allocations for all aliens except Americans with under party rights amendment, whose rights protected by the again the party clause of the Lowry Langley Agreement. Um, and for that, then we look at it as um, 
a lot of people could not accept then um, this kind of policy of Garcia. So, but however, according to Garcia, the Philippines had only achieved for the first time self-sufficiency in food, but also had already garnered a uh, surpluses in rice, corn, and Virginia tobacco. Chuck up for the first time post war history favorable balance of payments. Uh, increase its dollar reserve. But again, people could not feel it because, again, it would be a long term. Um, probably it can be taken like a decade before this program will be felt actually by the people. So if you are going to launch unpopular policies during your presidency, then people will not be happy to what you have done, but they will be thankful for you afterwards. And I think uh, looking at public peace administration, you can see then that Garcia was able then to do this with austerity, with Filipino first policy, as part of tradition. Again, it could be a part of the compassion as well as the integrity, as the core values that uh, ANU graduates should have or should also manifest them. As mentioned there, uh, not everyone is happy with the Philippine universe policy, as uh, said here by, by um, American writer uh, A. B. H. Hartendorf. He said that the slogan is inspired by anti-sectionalism, but by greed and cupidity. Um, Asia for the Asians, according to them, talk President Garcia to task for depending economic controls and succumbing to a policy of fascist slogan. It's a get-up policy, a tactical maneuver to obtain more from the United States. Uh, it's extreme nationalism. But again, if you look at it, uh, even today, uh, it's been adopted in our constitution. And there's nothing wrong with this. Um, something like looking at uh, giving priorities first to what we have before we can have foreign investors coming in in our territory. Um, American investors, according to uh, historian Colato, American uh, historian Nick Colato, said that to the Philippines, uh, I have The few American investors started business found out that profits could not be made, but only by the swelling to play. But again, uh, it's more a criticism that uh, should also be considered again because uh, the Americans were bringing their profits out of the country instead of, again of being used here. So it's something uh, when the, the policy was implemented, of course, we focused on giving preference to us. Also, this time, the Retail Trade National Act was being implemented, which displaced the Chinese uh, with that retail trade. And we focus also, again, with our own Filipino um, merchants and traders. So I think there's nothing wrong with this. But of course, for the Americans, that is unacceptable. And the last core values that I'd look upon will be the core values of innovation, respect, and resilience. Um, in your, again, a new core values of innovation, trying to promote then a new innovative ideals of what is to be done then. And I'm looking at it in a foreign policy context, uh, as well as the respect that Garcia wanted the Philippines to recognize as such, as an independent state. And of course, resiliency, because again, it's a problem that we have at that. Um, I wrote my master's thesis actually with this uh, foreign, as I mentioned again, I focus on foreign policy, the policy of respectable independence of Carlos P. Garcia as a foreign policy uh, during the Cold War. So why have this kind of foreign policy then? So according to, again, uh, Felix Berto Serrano, uh, Garcia's Secretary of Foreign Affairs, who must have been the very vocal in introducing this foreign policy, since the birth of the Philippines, our foreign policy doesn't have a reputation at home and abroad as everything but our own. Uh, in international private circles, uh, we have been um, mere characterized as a mere image of the United States. And true enough, uh, in 1980s, in 1987, there's actually even a documentary in our image. The Americans are very proud to say that we have been a product of their American experiment in Asia. And Emmett Garcia was able to recognize that as early as 1957. He said then that's a country with split personality. Western and particularly Americans to our uh, Asian neighbors. Again, that's a problem with that. And unrecognizably Asian to our Western friends as a troubling people without a national soul. As a country that speaks but whose voice is not capable of identification. So Garcia described to us the first 10 years of our independence, instead of us being recognized as an independent state, we've been recognized as a mere puppet of the Americans, a mere image of the United States. No one respects us, even if we are so vocal in our stand in the United Nations, in different international communities, organizations, no one recognizes us. In the Bandung Conference of 1955, after the Temple we're only tagged as an observer because, again, no one would like us to be part or no one us recognized as an independent state. When uh, President Carlos, sorry, President Elpidio Quirino launched the Baguio Conference for the Asian only few camps attended. Because everyone said that it's only an, an extension 
of the American again hegemony in um, Southeast Asia or in Asia in general. So the idea there is that this is what Garcia had faced. Of. It's a part of the innovation. And I think that's also your core values then. The innovation, how are you going to change it then? So what would happen then, according to Garcia, is that we have to launch this kind of respectable independence. It's a process of discovery and rediscovery, of reconstruction of old ties and construction of new ones, of tearing down deep-rooted prejudices which have hardened with time, of developing new values without destroying old ones, of correcting inequalities without antagonism, and of trying to secure in an awfully insecure world. It's the rediscovery of the roots of our national soul and the gradual revival and the immense, uh, springs, immense springs of our Asian identity. I think that's much highlighted. Uh, while Asian Center was established earlier, it was not that focused much. And the UP Asian Center it focused much actually when, again, trying to identify our uh, identity. But it was Garcia's time that we focused mainly on Looking at the uh, looking at again being part of Asia, I think the Asia. I mean, um, we have now to recognize ourselves we are part of Asia. So we have to open a lot of uh, embassies of the Philippines in Asia and trying to do away with too much of being a Western one. But again, we're not abandoning it. We're just trying to look at that. That can we also look at reorient ourselves in Asia? And it could be just that the Mahapaga later on would really have uh, uh, a big uh, gain with this with our Asianness when he reoriented mainly our Asian foreign policy. So, uh, and we have to cherish, of course, according to Garcia, uh, in common with the United States, uh, our supposedly values that we gained during the colonization, and rectification of inequitable conditions that treaties are really have entered into, especially, let's say, in the case of um, the Military Business Agreement, or the MBA. It was actually hotly controversial during Garcia's time, and even before with Mahapagalas, during exercise time, but it was Garcia able then to look, I mean, Olongapo City was being freed out or being given back to the Philippines after a long time. So it's also been um, some advantage we get then from the Clark and Subic actually military bases. So it's been security under, of course, with the support of that of the Americans. So these are some of the principles that highlighted here. And again, it's quite applicable with the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and Russia, the war of Ukraine and Russia, with the concept again of sovereign equality and mutuality of interests. Uh, well, is it true that the Americans actually is a giant? The Americans are giant. I mean, the U.S. is a giant actually in foreign, in foreign relations. But it has to recognize us. It has to give us actually what you call a sovereign equality. So it's possibly similar to what Ukraine has been saying now in the case of Russia, that definitely you have to recognize as our independence. And think uh, with the Philippine statement just uh, the other day in the United Nations, um, it actually boils down to the concept of uh, territorial integrity and likewise sovereign equality, recognize our independence as a country then. And similarly, that was Garcia was saying with the Americans even before. He was suggesting again that no, we ha you have to work it out, you have to recognize our independence, and you have to deal with us, not as beggars, again, as a part with the previous mendicant foreign policy as uh, of Carlos Piquerí, I mean, of, I'm sorry, of Pedro Carina and Manuel Rojas. So the problem is that you have to look at it in respect us as actually as a state. So going then to your uh, core value of respect. And um, also, um, he would be reorienting a good neighbor policy, which again, again would have gained more in the Philippine Asian relations and the independent sovereign state in the UN. And I'm very proud, I think, uh, with the statement of the Philippines just the other day, uh, supporting Ukraine or something lambasting again the, the war. Uh, undertaken by Russia against Ukraine. And something that it would be Garcia's uh, main symbol again that we have to recognize under the Manila Declaration actually recognize the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states. We, I mean, why would invade other states? Basically, you have to respect them. And if you have some concerns, settle it diplomatically then. So it was Garcia's time under the good neighbor policy that we have to have the establishment of the situation of Southeast Asia, the predecessor actually of what you call the ASEAN now. So, there, uh, well, um, it was uh, at first you have to look at the Baguio Conference or the Asian Union of Pedro Carino, but then succeed. But with Garcia, um, you have actually the ASA in '61. That later on, with also have Mapelendo later on with Mapagal, then time of Marcos, you already have the ASEAN. But ASA actually would be the predecessor. The Philippines, Thailand, at the time, Federation of Malaya, later on Malaysia, 
work together to organize an organization in Southeast Asia. So the ASA itself would serve as that. And with the Bangkok Declaration, actually, uh, we're able to look beyond that. Then also, um, despite, again, being a war hero himself, um, he would be recognized likewise by Japan as the first president, actually, uh, first head of state to speak on the diet of Japanese parliament. And um, I think um, it's very controversial here because Garcia was so... Uh, Flat, was totally, was so impressed with the Japanese. But later on, his leaders would say, "No, uh, you're a war hero. Uh, people make, might uh, inter misinterpret that if you supposedly uh, tell something about Japan or be somewhat be enamored with most of Japan." Then also have our Philippine-Taiwan relations. Uh, this time, after Chairman Mao course with the Beijing, um, in the uh, 1949 uh, Chinese Revolution, uh, China meant overthrow actually of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. We continued recognizing actually uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Republic of China in Taiwan. Our main issues there would be, of course, the overstaying Chinese nationals that we have deported to Taiwan. Then we also recognize the Philippines, South Vietnam, of course, uh, South Vietnam um, at that time still under the Vietnam War fighting with Ho Chi Minh. And we recognize Ngon Dien Diem at the time president of South Vietnam. So we have been very active actually. Garcia was then traveling from one place to another in Asia just to show them our new recognized or our uh, something like a recognition that we are part of Asia and no longer actually thinking of being part of the Western world. We have accepted our faith, we are part of Asia. And again, this will be continued later on by Makapagal who said then about we are really part of Asia and we should stop pretending not to be part of it or pretending to be uh, a Western state then. Just like what happened in the previous administrations of uh, Rojas, Quirino, and Magsaysay. Uh, to the end then, how do we view Garcia? So I think um, if you look at the core values of Garcia, um, the core values of NU, as I mentioned here, uh, we can say then that Garcia actually uh, manifested them. Garcia actually uh, embodied them and exemplified them from the values of compassion, from the values actually of patriotism, uh, respect, innovation, resilience. Uh, I think Garcia was able to show it to his life. Uh, how is it being done? Despite his weaknesses, if it may consider as such, uh, like once again, uh, the limitations during his four year in office, and again, the opposition from all walks, actually, from uh, from national politicians, national elites, and the urban elites, and again, even from of course, the United States, he was able to survive, he was able to work on that. But sad to say, again, uh, his legacy is left, again, uh, still to be discovered and still to be studied much. So I encourage everyone, uh, the field is open. Um, you might look at this person after they characterize him as such and focus mainly on different ideals. As I mentioned, I'm now uh, moving on with the concept of intellectual history of him and moving from my previous um, uh, view on him as only as a foreign policy actor. But I think he goes beyond that. And there's a need to re-examine this person and the need again to contextualize him. I think it's a good thing that with uh, here with uh, National University that you are still trying to fit in him. I think um, viewing him with your core values would make him more as a person and would characterize him beyond that of his uh, title or beyond uh, of the recognition being not being afforded to him. Thank you very much um, for uh, giving me a chance to share my study on Carlos P. Garcia. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Attorney Madrona, for that very informative and inspiring story about President Garcia. I do believe that uh, he is proud right now as the NU community honor his legacy, especially for the Filipinos. Now, to give us some insights about Papaloy, let us hear some reactions and insights by an authority in the field of history. He is from the Social Sciences Cluster of NU Manila. Let us all welcome Mr. Eli Ortiz. Good morning to all. Maraming maraming salamat po sa ganitong oportunidad upang uh, makapag-react po. And I'm thank you, thank you very much po uh, for the introduction. And also with Dean Madrona, it's very enlightening to go back to the times when uh, Garcia uh, headed our country at the time. But a simple reaction to this, I, I would 
think of it that uh, during the time of Garcia, we could also look at its context. It's true that we have to re re-examine it. And one of the things that uh, uh, I was actually re-examining it, it, we could see what is the problem during our domestic period at that time, uh, during the time of uh, Magsaysay. And probably Of, of, we would we be presenting such laws no happen to it i believe there is a law that was actually approved by garcia the anti-subversion law of 1957 and i believe he is the one also uh, who actually um, pursue it no because in our domestic problem we have the uh, the problems of the old communist party at the time uh, I thought it was actually plain during the, the time of Magsaysay, eh, okay na, no? But during that time, it spilled over during the time of of, of, of Garcia that we have a problem with the Communist Party, no? During the time when in Central Luzon. And he actually uh, uh, approved the anti subversion law. But come to think of it, uh, I was actually looking at either it is a coincidence here in our in our as I alumnus no alumnus po si, si Garcia may alumnus din po tayo na pangalawang pangulo na probably this will be discussed by next week about Ramos eh, but Ramos uh, repealed it no yung anti subversion no it, it was actually legalized so uh, I was looking at it kung coincidence po yung the same alumnus of NU one who approved the anti-subversion law and then by 1992 it was actually uh, repealed it by President Ramos and here in our context today we have a problem with the new people's army and, or the new communist party right now in our domestic problem which is the same also what is happening during the time of Garcia that we have now the anti-subversion law I, what, what I mean the anti-terror law so I believe the, the, the problem in our domestic, like communism, you know, during the time of Garcia, uh, there is that kind of what we call domino effect, which uh, popularized by the United States, now that would, bit by bit, all of the Asian countries would be uh, dominated by com communist insurgents, no? uh, communists like, for example, the, the Korean War during the 1950, the Vietnam War, and even the communist bloc, which is actually, it is true that our uh, uh, Dean Madrono would, would look at what is the problem in, in, in Ukraine right now, which is, I, I equate it also during that Cuban Missile Crisis of the 1960s, you know, no? at, at the doorstep of, of the United States, there's a problem about, about Cuba. The same also right now, no? there is a, at the doorstep of uh, Moscow, Russia, no? geographically speaking, if you look at the geopolitics during the time of Garcia, it, the same. No? So, it is true. This would give us an idea to where what happened during the time of Garcia, uh, the leadership of Garcia, it pushes all of these laws because of our domestic problem. Until now, there is. No? I, I believe that Garcia teaches us tr the true patriotism, the true nationalist form on what his leadership would give us an idea to push everything for our nation. It started with our domestic problem, and I hope even the time today, you know, the, the Duterte uh, administration would give this kind of, of laws, the anti-terror law, we would reflect also to the anti surveillance law in 1957 that was approved by Carlos P. Garcia. Now, in conclusion, uh, it is true that uh, Garcia gave us all of these things, no? And it is true also that Dean Madrono said that this this person, kukunti pa lang yung, yung, yung nag, nag aaral sa kanya. And I, I believe na pwede pa natin pag-aralan uh, rather than the popularized 
popularize uh, program of Garcia the first policy uh, first, first Filipino policy na ipinapakita ni Garcia na na popularized by Agoncillo ni even um, probably Constantino or Saide that what that was the main program but probably the the anti subversion law that what that was approved in 1957 no would hold us that we need that rather than in 1992 was repealed it. That's why we have this anti-terror law, law uh, under the Duterte administration. So, uh, it is an opportune time to look all of these historical uh, things that happened to, to uh, Carlos Pigars. Would, uh, give uh, Dean Madruno a hands up, no, uh, a thumbs up. I mean, no, with what he presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ortiz. So may now, may we now request our viewers to type in their questions in the FB Live chat box in our live streams preferably in the National and Heritage Museo and in our MS Teams chat box for the National and Employees and Students tuned in. Or you may just simply um, click the raise hand button in your MS Teams portal to ask or comment directly. We'll be waiting for your questions. So while you're typing or you're still uh, contextualizing your questions, let us now first our uh, let's now first have the shout outs or a uh, roll call of the attendees from the different NU campuses. Would you kindly react participants from NU Manila are you there? Do you have participants from NU Manila so we have a lot? Okay. That's a lot. NU Nazareth. NU Nazareth. We also have a lot. All right. NU Laguna. Do you have participants from NU Laguna? We have some. Okay. NU Moa. Oh, we have we have a lot also. NU Fairview. NU Fairview. How about NU Baliwag? We have quite number. NU Dasmarinas. Okay, NU Lipa. APC. Okay, so as well as our guests from the different institutions, happy viewing to all. Okay, so do we have questions? Okay, so we have a question from Professor Garcia. So would you consider Carlos P. Garcia the best president the Philippines ever had, especially with his Filipino first policy? Uh, take, can I answer? No. Yes. Ah, thank, thank you, uh, Professor Garcia, for the question. I think uh, it's also difficult to look at the what's the criterion for the best president because, again, uh, uh, the standards that we will be looking at will be very different. But I would say then that uh, he's one of Garcia was one actually of uh, the best uh, president with respect to fiscal policy, uh, able again to uh, surpass the deficit economy undertaken by his predecessor and able to surpass it and. Uh, taken advantage later on by succeeding presidency. So uh, by becoming unpopular with this authority policy and becoming unpopular, of course, with Filipino policy with respect to the Americans and again, focusing too much with the rights of the Filipinos in the domestic trade. So I think um, he can categorize him as such. Uh, I think the fiscal management, I guess uh, that's one also of the possible criteria looking at him being the best. But um, if you look at... Uh, I think the weaknesses of Garcia, then uh, it also being a uh, counterbalance with that. I mean, uh, he's being uh, weak in, um, I mean, letting the people know what is in his mind and letting the people know again that uh, what what they, they can do it. I mean, the idea of him, I mean, the, I mean uh, as I mentioned here, and, um, 
he let his uh, key cabinet members or policymakers to be the one to speak up. So people actually would not really know much about what he really wants. So uh, we have to read between the lines of what his uh, spokesman, uh, spokesman member is saying. So I think that could be one of the possible weaknesses of him that uh, should have been also strengthened by him, by Garcia. But uh, in fiscal administration, um, I think he uh, he's one of the best ones that able then to um, I mean guide or uh, stir our economy uh, despite again the um, the deficit one uh, undertaken during the time of President uh, Ramon Magsaysay. So I'm looking at it in the fiscal management side as as uh, in the part of the question. But again, thank you, Professor Garcia. Thank you, thank you, sir. So we have another question, Professor Villas. So, do you think CP Garcia's Filipino first policy and other foreign policies be applicable in today's period and situation? Um, the Filipino first policy actually is enshrined in our 1987 Philippine Constitution. Actually, it's also an, one of my main arguments when I wrote my thesis that it's been adopted well by Mahapagal, by, Ram, by uh, Marcos, and even when uh, the 19th Constitutional Commission uh, drafted our constitution that we have today, we, we provided it. And actually, uh, everyone is surprised that later on when even our own Supreme Court cited the Filipino first policy uh, in the case actually involving Manila Hotel, the Supreme Court actually mentioned the history of Filipino first policy that's been launched in the Garcia's time. So it's there. It's there. Actually, it's been there. We've been actually, uh, uh, it's been in strong institution and we've been, uh, once in a while, we've been citing it to justify then that we have to give preference to our Filipino traders or our Filipino merchants. And I think that's also one of the reasons why we have a lot of objections to the proposal again to open up our economy to foreigners or to allow foreigners to own lands or amending the economic provisions of the institution. Because again, of that, uh, quote-unquote, they call it conservative, uh, protectionist, Filipino first policy. But I think this is, uh, unless it could be amended uh, later on, that this is a good uh, provision of the institution again, that it's still that we'll be using it. So despite, again, a lot of backlash and a lot of misinterpretation, uh, I would say that... Uh, um, it's still very much applicable. Uh, likewise, the policy of civil independence has been, um, as mentioned, looking again at being a part of Asia. So uh, being an active member of ASEAN, just again celebrating uh, the anniversary after is that we're looking at it now as being part. I mean, um, uh, Garcia is still oriented uh, to be part of Asia or being part again, uh, forgetting ourselves that we're no longer part of uh, Europe itself, the Western world. So I think um, it, this policy is still being applicable. Um, but if you look at parts of austerity, probably uh, we have this case likewise during the time of President Gloria uh, Macapagal Arroyo, where you also have again because of the problem with the economy. So it has been looking at it differently. But thank you, Professor Villegas. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we also have a question from Professor Argonza. So, what quality or political move did President Garcia have that distinguishes him? Was it his First policy only. Thank you, sir. Actually, um, one Japanese historian, Yusuke Takagi, was arguing in his uh, doctoral dissertation that Philippine first policy was not Garcia himself. So basically, uh, I myself also did not consider it as the only foreign policy, the only quote unquote policy of Garcia. So uh, while um, again, I consider and Constantino were uh, focusing too much on other historians of Philippines with policy. In my case, actually, I didn't look at as much. I have tried my best not to focus on that policy because, again, I'm looking at that. Um, um, it was during even his time that it was not really, um, as we mentioned, some materials would say that he was at first even against of it. But it was his advisors who kept on tampering that it should be our policy then. Because, again, he's actually uh, he's weighing all the consequences and or the repercussions of being uh, the man actually of uh, trying to weigh down everything. So. I'm not looking at Filipino first policy as the only policy to recognize Garcia. And as I mentioned, even as uh, uh, Japanese historian Yusuke Takagi was arguing that it was not even Garcia himself. So I think uh, the main trait of Garcia that I would say that would exemplify him is uh, to be a patient man. Uh, he's really patient. Because the idea again is that um, being patient uh, is not 
a characteristic of a politician, so to speak. Because again, some politicians will just act immediately because of popular will. But with Garcia, being a way, I mean, uh, being patient and he weigh everything actually, um, it would give him an opportunity then to launch a, a sound policy. Like again, with austerity policy or the policy of independence. So I think trying to be patient. But again, uh, for us Filipinos probably that are so used to some politicians are very populist who basically who listens to um, supposedly um, um, the bandwagon effect or who listens mainly with what should have been popular um, ideas. But Garcia actually would be looking at the unpopular ones. And I think that would be a, a major trait of him that also would cause his uh, political career. Because again, if you dig this kind of politician, then would be very rare now because a uh, majority of our politicians, of course, would just follow uh, the bandwagon, would follow what was the will of the people itself. But uh, in our context here is that uh, I want to say that I think uh, we need to look beyond that. So I think that is also one of the major reasons why Garcia probably was not a uh, well-studied personality because uh, he's not that active. He's not able to publish much. Everything would take time. Um, I think uh, he's uh, a, a, a rare in his generation to be a politician like that. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, we also have another one from Professor Villegas. He asks, um, did President Garcia mentor other politicians, um, politicians during and after his presidency? Uh, sad to say, actually, I mean, sad to say, but again, it was very mentioned that he was one of the mentors of President Ferdinand Marcos. So they're both actually uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, in the early days, early when the first four years of Marcos, because again, um, Marcos being a, a turncoat from liberal to nationalista, and Garcia, of course, was a nationalist leader during uh, nationalist leader at the time when uh, from uh, during the time when Marcos ran against Mahapagal. Uh, Garcia was one of the early mentors of uh, Marcos, although Garcia died before Marcelo, so he was not able then. Uh, we were not, uh, we cannot see then if um, Garcia would support uh, Marcos in the Marcelo period, or because Mahapagal did not support, of course, Marcos. But uh, we can see, of course, that he was one of uh, the few mentor, I mean, uh, mentors of President Marcos in the in the first four years in the, before Marcelo was declared. So I think that would be, and um, that also would help him to be elected as a president of the Concon in 1971 prior to his death. But of course, it was succeeded by his successor, Mahapagal. But uh, yes, I, I would say it was Marcos uh, that he mentored. And Marcos uh, uh, also mentioned Garcia as one of his leaders. Again, the fact again that he was an old or recognized leader of Nationalista Party when Marcos transferred from Liberal Party. All right. So we have a question from the FB Live. It says, does the moniker Balak Beauty, referring to President Garcia's smack of racism, vis-a-vis -vis CPG's literary genius? Uh, I would not say that it was actually more of uh, a racism because, again, uh, Balak actually has been recognized in uh, the Cebuano region, or in Bohol region, Cebuano region, at least, as, again, uh, those uh, who are well-versed actually uh, in... Um, uh, Cebuano language and I mean, making poems or making actual literary works. So I think uh, Balak uh, still is, is still uh, a recognized medium actually of uh, communicating or uh, as part of a uh, literary um, medium in the in the Visayas region. I think uh, I think it's more also of recognizing him as such. And although uh, as mentioned even by Romulo that um, he's uh, mentioned with his uh, flowery words. Because again, that's also the problem with him. Maybe that's the thing that he could not um, enunciate much of his policy because he is acting in a literary world that uh, people might misinterpret him differently because he is uh, saying it in a, uh, in a praises or literary praises. And he could not avoid that because again, he's a Balak, uh, is actually a Visayan uh, prince of uh, poetry or penetrator actually, and he can really speak that much. So I think it's also there may be a problem of misinterpreting him as such. So uh, I'm not saying that it's a research that is more with, uh, I can look at it differently that it's a recognition of him as a literary genius. 
Okay, we have another question from uh, Professor Lira. Is it true that the attributes and best characteristics of past President Carlos P. Garcia were present among some of the aspiring presidential candidates for the upcoming election this May 9, 2022? If yes, who is most closely related to him and why? Well, uh, watching the presidential debates and watching actually the interviews uh, in social media, I mean, media actually, um, we can say that, that well, uh, there at least one uh, presidential candidate who has been there uh, swaying. I mean, he's actually, all the people misinterpreted it differently, but she's actually weighing all of all possibilities. And I think that's one of the traits of Carlos P. Garcia. So um, the idea again is that um, if you weigh down all the, all the chances and all the options, and I think that's very clear with the way she actually, uh, well, it's only speaking for the only one woman candidate, by the way. So again, she's actually speaking up uh, on her mind and, She's actually, she should not mention it definitely. That's why uh, some people, mis and again, the same with Garcia, misinterpreting it that someone that, uh, not that, can, because people again would love someone to very, uh, um, I mean, energetic to say that this is the policy policy. But for Garcia, no, I think that you have to weigh down the option opportunity. So before you can speak up something, can you weigh down everything then? And I think uh, reading actually her uh, notes as she published social media, I can see that she actually, uh, maybe uh, actually uh, working with the characters like Garcia. That uh, although I don't think it's a weakness, but because as I've seen in the case of Garcia, people misinterpreted it differently. So I think she's now being lambasted for uh, possibly some of her um, um, statements. That basically for me as an an, an expert with Carlos B. Garcia, I can say that no, I think that's that it should be. I mean, and technically she's also an economist. So the idea again is that she 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 knows that. What's happening now? That sooner or later we can have economic deficit or budget government will it be? So uh, I think I can look at, of course, um, the vice president uh, Lenny Robredo, uh, similar with Garcia before, uh, the vice president likewise, as somewhat has this characteristic of weighing all the possible. I think I, I believe that's a good trait. Uh, although again, for some people who really works it out with uh, a more uh, uh, direct action uh, formal uh, might not. I would that's part of it. Thank you for that. So let's have our last question. This is from our FB Live from Luigi Romanilios. So why did the Philippines wait for Makapagal to change the Philippine Independence Day from July 4 to July 12? It had been early on observed that diplomats flocked to the U.S. Embassy on the July 4th and uh, hardly bothered to go to the Philippine Embassy. Your comments, please. Uh, again, it's a different one because, uh, of course, there's uh, a Filipino historian has been fighting for this, that the Declaration of Independence be moved from July 4 to uh, June 12. And it was, Bahapagal, um, actually, you talked the schedule for that. So it was not that taken much uh, during Garcia's time. And if you're going to look, likewise, on uh, aside from that advocacy or lobbying to change the independence, it was also during the time then when the Americans did not, uh, or the U.S. Congress did not approve our war rehabilitation bill or additional, again, uh, war damage claim that we had with the Americans. So in the U.S. Congress did not grant it. Uh, Makapagal actually uh, used this as an excuse then to change it. So generally, um, it was a history, or it was a different outlook, a lobbying for the changing of the independence. At the same time, likewise, it was also a look at uh, that were the dynamics at the time when Mahapagal again talking the casual from Garcia to reorient our history, moving out from the Americans, uh, moving out from the Americans and focusing with, let's say, uh, Spain uh, as our quote unquote mother Spain during her time. And then looking at also with being Asia. So uh, I would say that um, it was a compilation with itself. And uh, we, would, we would say it as uh, Garcia did not take that much opportunity during his time. And uh, it was Mahapagal who did it. So, it, again, as I mentioned, uh, being the two of them uh, working at, as part. Um, as I mentioned, lang, um, I'm, I'm also doing, uh, I'm also focused with Mahapagal because, again, my dissertation focused with Garcia and Mahapagal because I have to continue my study on the two presidents uh, before Marcos so just to look at the continuity of the, their policies. So, um, that would be my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, all right. So let's now proceed to the awarding of the e-certificate.
the e-certificate, please. May we request for the e-certificate to be flashed on the screen? Okay, so let me read the citation. NUSAS Nationalian Cluster, the National University Heritage Committee, Language Institute awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Attorney Severo C. Madrona Jr. PhD for sharing his expertise in the webinar entitled Paolo's Respectable Love of Country and Independence. Given the second day of March 2022 at the National University Manila via MS Team signed Richard Ryan C. Villegas, PhD, Cluster Coordinator, the Nationalian, and Maris Renani S. Garcia, PhD, Head of the NU Heritage Committee and Principal of the NU Nazareth Senior High School. All right. So, if for the participants, for your certificate of participation, kindly accomplish the evaluation link. Posted by Professor Villa Diego in the chat box. Let us all give a round of applause to Attorney Severo Madrona. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, sir, for spending time with us and sharing your knowledge with regards to Prof. Uh, to President Garcia. All right. May we request the participants also to open their cameras for the photo op. Let's have the photo op. Who will be taking the screenshot? Are we ready? Okay. Who will take the screenshot? Um Professor Villegas? Okay, let's smile. Um, one, two, three, smile. Okay. Another one. Another one. One, two, three, smile, everyone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Now, to cap this event, may we call on our very own NU Nazareth SHS Principal, Dr. Mario Hernani S. Garcia. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. And we thank Attorney and Dean Severo Madrona for having us today. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. And it was made even more interesting with that discussion on he on the character of Carlos P. Garcia. And we are very glad to have heard so much about him, the details of him as a prayer, as a very methodical person, uh, very cool, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The treatment of the subject matter was really an in-depth one. Uh, it gives us a good idea of what it is to be a good nationalian, especially with the 
intertwining of his achievements and his character with our core values of uh, integrity, compassion, innovation, resilience, and patriotism. He has also made uh, Carlos Piggers even more relevant today with the discussion of the different issues then during the time of Carlos P. Garcia. I, will not, I won't mention uh, many of them, uh, but he, Carlos P. Garcia was truly a good statesman for us Filipinos, and he led the country as a true Filipino. But I would like to mention also our founder, Don Mariano Fortunato Oxon, whose intense love of country and nationalistic fervor founded National University in uh, a foresight to educate young Filipino boys and girls to be learned, to be leaders of this country, to be the future governors of our country, independent from foreign domination. We also thank the founder for that. And of course, uh, I, could, I want to mention also, to summarize the presentation of uh, Tony Severo Madrona, that Carlos P. Garcia was a true nationalistic person. He was a nationalist. He was an internationalist. He was also very democratic, a true dynamic Filipino, a true dynamic leader. So with that, uh, I would like to thank again, Dean uh, Severo for presenting a very interesting topic for today. Um, he was able to present Carlos P. Garcia as a one true national young graduate and a true blooded national young. I also want to thank all the attendees today and the future attendees. I hope uh, you can disseminate the, the presentation today via Facebook and the recorded uh, presentation so that Carlos P. Garcia will be known better in other uh, schools or to our fellow uh, Filipinos because we can learn so much about the presentation, about how we can approach the present problems of today. We are not veering away from those problems, actually. But with the presentation of uh, Dean Severo, uh, we have come to know that they are still relevant. The issues then are still relevant today. And he has made Carlos P. Garcia very relevant today. So with that, uh, I want to close the webinar today. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Attorney Severo Matrona. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. So I think this is just it. But before we end, we would like to thank Attorney Severo Madrona Jr. for gracing this event despite his busy schedule. Indeed, the Nationalian community and our guests learned a lot about President Garcia and his enduring legacy. We would also like to thank those who shared this webinar in their respective Facebook pages. Mr. Mark Angelo Kwayong Kwaikong. Mr. Adelino Manching for streaming this webinar in Facebook Live. To Ms. Christine Villadiego of the Language Institute for assisting in the flow for the entire event. To the Museo ng Pamana at Kasaysayang Buholano and the Garcia Museum and Cafe for allowing this to be cross-potted in their page. And to all who attended this webinar, including our alumni and guests. Again, don't forget to like our Nationalian Heritage and Museo uh, Museo at Aklatan ni Pangulong Diosdado Makapagal FB Pages. It's at Nationalian Heritage and at Boholano Museum. And lastly, don't forget to answer the evaluation form posted in the MS Teams for your e-certificates. Again, thank you for tuning in to this webinar and we hope that you learned a lot about the stories about President Carlos P. Garcia for the Nationalian Cluster the NU Heritage Committee, the Language Institute. I am Leroy Rubio, and we will see you again next in, in our next webinar. Have a great week and stay safe always. Now, let's all sing with honor and pride our National U Hymn. Thank you so much.
Hey! 